But I want to go through um, some extra things. And this is really kind of nomenclature <clears throat> because the odds of anyone actually working in any of these metals is probably pretty slim, right? Um, but in this, the sake of being well-rounded and knowing metallurgy, you should at least know what the main classes of cast iron are and, and uh, what the various important copper alloys are. So I'll go through this pretty quickly, even though there's a bunch of slides. Okay, so cast iron, um, ferrous metals that contain more than 1.7% carbon, okay? So like steels, alloys of iron and carbon, and I know that contradicts the definition I gave for steel, right? Because I talked about how steel doesn't necessarily have to have carbon, like IF steel. Um, and then I duplicated myself here more than approximately 2% common. I didn't realize I, I did that. Okay, so most of the commercially manufactured types are gonna be in the range of two and a half to 4%, but there's a bunch of other useful alloying elements in there. Uh, silicon uh, is going to shift the eutectic to lower carbon. It's a strong graphite former, right? Um, so oftentimes people will combine the carbon and the multiply the, car the silicon by three and add it to the carbon and call that the effective carbon content. Um, manganese is essentially the opposite of silicon. It, it's a cementite former, right? Whereas uh, silicon is a graphite former. It also scavenges sulfur, which can be an impurity. Chromium, titanium, and vanadium are also cementite formers, but they're typically added more as grain refiners. Phosphorus is important for casting, right? It, in, it reduces the viscosity and increases the fluidity, and it also forms strengthening phosphides. Um, in there, sulfur uh, can either be an impurity if it's greater than 0.1% or a beneficial alloying if it's in this range, and this forms iron sulfide, um, which also prevents graphite but also the sulfides uh, increase, increase hardness and strength, okay? So the first class of cast iron or what is called, what we'll call white cast irons, <coughs> and these are hypoeutectic, right? Which is in contrast to the near eutectoid compositions, right? Here we're talking about the actual true eutectic. Uh, here, so we come down, um, so these are in, normally in the range of 1.8 to 3.6% 3. 3. carbon with some silicon and manganese added. So on cooling down, we first form austenite, and then we come into this austenite and cementite region where um, you get uh, lead barite, which is sometimes called eutectic cementite, right? So this is uh, essentially, this white is austenite, this dark is a mixture of eutectic austenite, or, or the regions that appear black on here would be a mixture of eutectic austenite and cementite, and then you're gonna cool down and the austenite's gonna decompose into perlite, right? primarily, which is going to be ferrite and additional cementite, right? So on cooling below the A1 line, the austenite decomposes into perlite, and the final mic microstructure is really a composite of perlite and cementite, right? So it's really much more of a cement than a metal, right? Most of it is going to be Fe3C. Uh, which is which is ionic, right? So you can imagine that this is incredibly brittle due to the large amount of cementite that you have, very high hardness, right? 
relatively low tensile strength. So we get perfect brittle fracture at around 125 KSI, right? Um, no, I converted from KSI. This should be MPA. This is about 45 KSI, sorry. This is about, M this is, I, I converted this to MP, M uh, megapascals and forgot to change this, right? So the fractured surface of this material appears white which is why it's called um, uh, why it's called white cast iron. It needs to be cooled very rapidly because if you look at the the, equal, the the equilibrium phase diagram, right? Graphite's the equilibrium structure. The cementite is metastable, right? So if you cool it fast enough, you get cementite. If you cool it slowly, we're going to get graphite. And enter into what's called the gray gray irons, right? And this is used um, for the hardness and resistance to abrasive wear. Um, things like uh, brake shoes, not for cars, but for indust industry equipment, industrial equipment, shot blasting nozzles, right? Um, mill liners, crusher, pump impeller, impellers. Anytime you have um, uh, abrasion to very uh, wear resistant surface. Generally, white iron though isn't used so much by itself, but it's produced as an intermediary um, in the production of malleable, malleable iron, right? Which is a different form of cast iron. There's also an important subcategory called nickel chromium white cast iron. Sometimes this is called alloy iron. Right, where essentially you cool it really fast with uh, nickel and chromium in there, right, which is going to suppress the formation of perlite, and you get uh, martensite matrix with cementite, right? So you can imagine how brittle how that's going to be. Um, the chromium is the nickel delays the formation of perlite, the chromium. Uh, prevents the formation of graphite. So we want to say everything uh, stays as cementite, right? And so this is um, uh, really used for when you need extreme abrasion, extreme abrasion resistance, right? So the most, um, and you can see the microstructure here, right? So this is a mixture of Martensite and cementite, and this is cementite. Gray cast iron is the most common, right? This is what your frying pan's made out of, right? When you break, break it, you get that dull gray color. Um, the least expensive to produce, right? We're still in the carbon range of about two and a half to four percent, so still generally hypo eutectic, right? The eutectic is 4.2%. And then uh, we've got some silicon in there and a little bit of manganese. And essentially, we get small interconnected graphite flakes that cause low strength and ductility, but it has some advantages, right? Um, besides that, it's besides being really cheap. Uh, we'll get to the properties on the next slide. But um, you can see here, we've got uh, free ferrite, some perlite, and then this black regions here, this is graphite. This graphite used to be called black lead. So if you see older books or texts and they refer to black lead and iron, they're talking about the graphite in cast iron, All right? And depending on how it's processed, this can either be perlitic or ferritic, right? So here we have the alpha ferrite and graphite, right? So the properties of this, we have really good compressive strength, very good machinability. All that loose graphite in there means it's essentially self-lubricating, right? Um, um, very good resistance to sliding wear. Um, 
good resistance to thermal fatigue, good thermal conductivity, and most importantly, good vibration dampening. Right? I don't know if anyone's ever used a lathe to turn down something. So you usually have a chuck that holds your workpiece that's on a spindle, and the chuck is mounted to the spindle by a backing plate that is almost always made of cast iron because it's really good at absorbing the vibration um, and it avoids uh, sort of sympathetic um, or harmonic vibration while you're from while you're trying to to machine something right so we also have really good fluidity at casting temperatures we can cast intricate shapes right um, it doesn't have a lot of shrinkage. We're not really concerned about strength, right? It only has a tensile strength of 100 to 300 MPa. You know, you see this used a lot in small engine cylinder blocks, like your lawnmower, right? Or an old moped will typically have a cast iron engine block with a sleeve. Um, things, cylinder heads, pistons, things subject to vibration where you don't need a whole lot of a whole lot of strength, right? Old water pipes, my house in Philadelphia was built in 1880 and it had cast iron water pipes, which were a real pain because uh, they would corrode and your water pressure would decrease with time because of the buildup on the inside of your water pipes. Okay. So the ideal structure for this for gray iron is you really want small uniformly distributed flakes, right? It should be obvious why you want that by now, right? You don't want big, huge carbon, um, long, long flakes. So often small amounts of inoculating agents are alloying calcium, aluminum, titanium, zirconium, silicon carbide, silicon carbide, or distribution uh, dis or combinations of these, right? These are all essentially grain refiners. They promote the, the nucleation of primary austenite on cooling, right? Which is going to result in smaller austenite grains and smaller um, uh, carbon graphite flakes, right? And if you look in the, uh, the literature, these then become classified by types, right? Where you have um, <coughs> uh, the graphite can be clustered in different ways as a resulting of, of processing, <coughs> right? Uniformly, uh, where you have a, roughly a uniform spatial and size distribution clustered in rosettes a bimodal size with a uniform distribution, <coughs> segregation to the interdendritic regions, right? Or you can have a preferential alignment all depending on the composition and the casting conditions and this, how, it was, how it's uh, solidified, right? A, a sort of a, a cool compromise to this is chilled cast iron, right? White, white iron needs to be cooled very uh, um, quickly. And uh, if you cool it more slowly, you get gray iron for a lot of the same compositions. So chilled cast iron is essentially chilling into, or casting into a chilled or cooled mold. So you get white cast iron at the surface because of a very high cooling. And then in the middle of a thick casting where you have slower heat transfer, you have gray iron, right? So you've got a very tough, um, not tough, very strong uh, outer shell of white iron with a core of a little bit more ductile uh, uh, gray iron, right? Right. And then a couple other compositions is ductile or, or nodular cast iron, <coughs> sometimes called spheroidal graphite or nodular graphite iron. It's got a lot more ductility than gray 
cast iron, right? And essentially this, we give it an additional heat treatment. Um, or, oh, I'm jumping ahead here. So first we need to, we add some cerium or magnesium, right? Which is gonna cause the graphite to form as spherulites rather than flakes, kind of like the rosettes, but much more closely packed together, right? And then if we just cool it, we're gonna get uh, perlitic iron, but then we can give it some heat treatments um, uh, to, to give us uh, a microstructure of graphite nodules in plain, in plain ferrite. And we'll talk about that. The ferritic structure is a lot more ductile, but has a lower, a, a lower tensile strength than the perlite form, right? And this uh, um, ferritic nodular iron is really the only cast iron with really good weldability um, because you're not the, the graphite, you're not trying to weld cementite, basically. You're not trying to weld perlite. So the perlitic nodular cast iron, where'd my slide with the... Oh, okay, I have, I have it there. So the perlitic structure is this, right? You see the perlite, a region of uh, ferrite around the graphite the graphite nodule, right? So this is a region that's been the, the reduced in carbon. So this is plain, plain ferrite around it in a matrix of, of perlite, right? And ferritic, basically you, you can do additional heat treatments, oops, to force all the, uh, perlite to decompose into graphite and ferrite. So you've got these nice, really large nodular graphite nodules. Here you can see some retained, retained perlite, right? And the last kind of grouping is what we would call malleable cast iron, right? So this is basically you start with uh, white iron, right? And then we give it a, uh, start with 3% white iron, right? Or an equivalent carbon content. You know, I said it backwards. I wasn't thinking. I said multiply the silicon content by three, it's divide, right? It shouldn't have made any, should, should have, what well, doesn't make any sense, right? If you've got, 3% silicon to then have an equivalent carbon, or 1% silicon to then have an equivalent carbon content of six, right? Sorry about that. Um, um, I don't know my basic, basic mathematical operations, right? So here what we have is again, white cast iron, but then we, we dissociate the cementite into its component elements, so we'll get graphite clumps, right? So we have better ductility than greater white cast irons. That's also um, very machinable still because of the graphite nodules. So we, we have to uh, do a first stage graphitization where we decompose this, this stable austenite. Um, the cementite becomes stable austenite and graphite. Then the second stage, the, the slow cooling through the eutectic, eutectoid temperature to make ferritic malleable iron, right? And this is basically the same thing that we would do to the ductile uh, iron, right? Where we would then come through here, we would force the decomposition of the austenite and then a slow cool and we end up with uh, Um, ferrite and uh, and graphite. The main difference is, is here we're starting with white iron, so we have that whole amount of plain cementite that we're also decomposing. 
Whereas for with the ductile iron, we're only decomposing the the uh, austenite, right? Not the not the cementite as well. If we cool down quickly into uh, with quenching, we get martensite, and then we do a, a, essentially a tempering treatment that's called drawing for some reason. I don't know why it's called drawing, but it's basically tempering. We now have per perlitic malleable iron, right? Where we have uh, perlite instead of the ferrite, right? So the ferritic malleable iron look something like this. The nodules are not nearly as spherical as they are in ductile or nodular iron, but otherwise they're pretty similar in terms of properties and uh, structure. And then the perlitic here, we have a mix of graphite, perlite, and plain, some plain ferrite, right? So that's the general nomenclature on uh, cast irons, right? Again, you're not likely to ever experience these or look at the microstructure of them, or um, but it's useful just to know the general classes and and what they are, right? Um, I do have a couple couple extra things. So in terms of this ductile iron. I saw copper and thought I got to the brass section. Right. Uh, copper is sometimes added as a minor alloying element to increase tensile strength and, and corrosion resistance, right? We generally have pretty decent ultimate tensile strengths, 400 to 450 MPa, yield points of around 300 MPa. But the interesting thing is we can get elongation values of about 15% ductility, which is pretty good compared to the white iron, which is perfectly pure brittle, right? The hardness values are about one quarter of what they are for white, for white iron. Um, most of these applications are kind of outdated now, right? Like valve parts for railroad, right? You know, these are, you don't see a lot of, uh, this material being really produced much, much anymore, right? It's expensive and there's better alternatives. Um, a general classification based on hardness, right? Just, uh, just for your reference. And then this little table gives you kind of the nominal composition for each class and its, its properties. Um, and believe it or not, the best reference I actually found for this was Wikipedia. I was looking through the metals handbook and it was not nearly as uh, complete. And all the values in the metals handbook are still in KSI for uh, cast irons, right? Again, that tells you the age, right, of these, right? No one's really no one's really thought to update it since then, right? With proper uh, SI units. Um, so Wikipedia uh, is, the, is a really good uh, resource for this. Okay, on to the brasses. All right. Ideally, I would have liked to do a whole lecture on that, give a little bit more detail into the different treatments, but um, and a, a whole lecture on the brasses and bronzes, but the, we compress a little bit here. So brass, copper, and zinc, okay? The um, proportions of copper and zinc are varied over fairly wide ranges. Really the main application, there's really only two, two applications or, th or three big ones, right? Decorative because it looks nice and shiny. Right, um, low low sliding friction like locks, and uh, also corrosion resistance um, uh, for old naval things like the brass bell on a ship. You know, 
Um, but it's also really important. Brass and bronze are both used for non-sparking tools, right? The number of times, the number of situations, um, like if you're on a oil drilling platform, say, and you need to work with things, you need to avoid any sparks at all costs. Brass tools are really good for that, right? Iron steel tools, right? If you're striking something, right? You have a, a glancing blow, you have a chance of generating sparks and an explosion that kills you and other people, right? Um, so that's really the, uh, the, main, the main application now, other than decorative. So historical development, 3000 BC are the first in, in, the, in Turkey, right? As the first kind of uh, brass. So this is one of the earliest metals um, really that we use. Um, Right, they knew people, this was right in the Bronze Age, so people knew how to make bronze, but sometimes they made what they called bronze was actually brass without knowing it because elements were not really well defined back then. So different recipes. Um, it wasn't until the late 1800s uh, that zinc was identified as an element and really the process for creating what we would call modern brasses didn't happen until uh, the late, the late 1800s, uh, the late 1700s, the late 18th century. So if we look at the brass zinc phase diagram, I mean brass, yeah, brass zinc phase diagram, right? Alpha here, this is FCC, beta and beta prime are BCC, Gamma is copper five zinc eight ordered this ordered structure, right? The IM forty three structure space group number two seventeen, All right? And so generally, brasses are broken up into either alpha brass, alpha plus beta brass, beta brasses, or uh, gamma brasses. Um, and then something that's called white brasses, which has uh, typically a mixture of uh, copper, zinc, strontium, tin, sometimes even zinc as over there. They have a more silvery rather than gold appearance, and they're too brittle to use for almost anything, right? So it's kind of just a historical term, the term white brass, All right? So... Alpha alloys are up to 35% zinc. They're single phase FCC, easy to cold, uh, uh, to cold work. The alpha plus beta brasses are two phase uh, duplex brasses. Um, and then there are uh, what are known as red brasses, which contain lead as well. Um, and those are uh, free machining brass, like uh, 340, right? The lead phase is really malleable and forms at grain boundaries, so it's really easy to, to machine. And it forms nice, easy chips rather than big stringy, stringy ribbons. Um, these are called gu leaded gunmetal in the rest of the English-speaking world, but here in the U.S. we call them red brasses. Don't know why, right? So the alpha brasses contain at least 63% copper, real good ductility at room temperature, um, easily deformed by cold rolling, deep drying. Um, and those with a higher copper content, lower zinc, tend to be more golden color, and they're really used extensively for uh, decorative metalwork. Right. The alpha plus beta 
alloys tend to be higher in uh, zinc, right? They contain um, a mixture of FCC and BCC uh, phases. They really cannot be cold worked, so they have to be typically hot extruded um, or hot forged into the into the shape that they're used. They're used more for um, strength. This projector does not really have the color resolution, but you can sort of see um, we, we really go for uh, this kind of a spectrum of gold to red based on the, the, the alloy and composition. There's a couple things we can do. Generally, if we want extra machinability, lead is added, one to four percent. Right? Again, this lead will come out as a as another phase, soft phase at the grain boundaries. Right? If we add manganese, aluminum, silicon, nickel, and iron, you get what's called high tensile brass with very high yield strengths and limited ductility. And if you still have a significant amount of zinc and add aluminum with arsenic, you get what you called are called aluminum brasses or naval brasses. And these are exceptionally corrosion resistant in seawater, right? So shiny things on boats, right? This is not to be confused with aluminum bronzes, right? Which is basically the same thing without the zinc and higher aluminum portion, right? They're, they're a little, they're a little different, right? So the big nomenclature for brass. And just to wrap it up, we'll talk about bronzes. And essentially a bronze is an alloy made of usually tin, but is copper and damn near anything else, right? So the classic bronze that everyone knows is uh, copper and tin, 88% copper, 12% tin by weight, right? It's golden very hard, brittle metal, right? And everyone knows the, the Bronze Age, right? Mid fourth century uh, began in India and Western Eurasia, right? For a long time, bronze was the hardest metal that there was. And Bronze against a bronze sword versus a copper sword would win every time, right? Very high yield strength, very high hardness, right? Think, you know, the pyramids were built with bronze tools, right? So not uh, nothing really to, to shake a, a stick at in terms of useful properties, right? And much easier to make than steel, right? So if we look at the copper tin phase diagram, it's an absolute mess, right? We've got a whole bunch of different, essentially line compounds or very narrow phase regions, right? Um, <clears throat> right, and so you can see the interesting thing is the uh, difference in melting point between pure copper and pure tin, right? So right away, you know, you can think uh, this is going to be problematic, right? Definitely not going to form a solid solution over its entire range. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff in between, right? If we look at the different phases and their crystal structure, right? Alpha and beta, right? So this alpha region here and this beta region here are FCC and BCC, right? Um, the gamma phase, um, <clears throat> 
is on here somewhere. Gamma is a cubic ordered, right? Uh, we've got um, uh, triclinic and hexagonal phases and a monoclinic phase, right? So it's, it's complicated, right? We can zoom in on the region that we have interest in. So typically what we're going to be is in this sort of general range. So depending, we're either going to come down to pure alpha, or if we come down into the alpha plus beta phase field, we're typically going to um, uh, cool down more, uh, um, more slowly oops, until we get to this alpha plus gamma field and then a fast quench will give us a final two-phase microstructure that most of the time is going to be alpha plus, plus gamma. So what are called wrought bronzes are typically up to 8% silicon. So we stay in the single-phase FCC regime. Easy to shake, easy to cold work. These cast bronzes can either fall under uh, this 8 to 12% largely FCC, 12 to 20, or greater than 20. And things greater than 20 are so hard and brittle, they're typically used as bell metals. They can't really be used for much else because they'll just crack, right? And even as bells and symbols, they sometimes crack, right? So here we can see this is uh, um, somewhere in the 8 to 20%. This is a mixture of alpha and gamma. This is a bell metal where we can see there's some lead globules, alpha phase, this gamma phase, um, some porosity and other, other stuff in there, right? So those are classical, classical bronzes. Aluminum bronze is an alloy of copper and aluminum, right? Rather than, uh, rather than tin or zinc. Right, so we have aluminum bronzes. Um, typically, we'll have other things in there: iron, nickel, manganese, and silicon that are sometimes added. These are very corrosion resistant, sometimes called marine bronzes. Right, um, and we can, you know, these are just sort of the most common uh, aluminum bronze alloys. The aluminum. Uh, uh, copper phase diagram is very much like the aluminum uh, tin phase diagram, right? A mess of different compounds. Here we have that this uh, casting aluminum bronze that has iron and nickel. And what you see here is this is this light is FCC alpha phase, and this dark is iron and nickel rich kappa phase, which has this DO3, DO3 structure. Right? So the microstructure and phase content of these are really a, um, can be a big mess. The last, or no, I have a couple more. Um, so there's also silicon bronzes, copper, silicon, with a little manganese in here. Um, and these are used for uh, screws and fasteners where uh, you don't want sparking, right? So they're strong, but can, are single phase, typically. They're, you're always in the alpha phase. Um, but the silicon gives you very high work hardening rates, right? So they're strong single phase and don't spark, right? And so that's where they're um, uh, commonly used. And that is honestly the only application I know of for these silicon bronzes is non-sparking fasteners. Phosphor bronzes 
So copper with less tin than regular bronzes, but with some added phosphorus, right? So the phosphorus gives you wear resistance, higher stiffness over plain tin bronzes, high toughness, high strength, low coefficient of friction. The phosphorus gives you a much lower viscosity, so better casting. Um, these are also the bronzes that are used for symbols, right? Uh, fall in this family. And I learned this when I was putting these together. Uh, there are actually some like high end saxophone and brass instruments that are actually made of phosphor bronzes, like really high end, like, like expensive for professional grade. But some people feel that I don't know if it's a gimmick, probably is because anything that that uh, uh, is sold to only the most expensive instrument of its kind, right? Um, is probably a, a gimmick. Also, the uh, wrapping on guitar strings, right? Um, so typically on either like a guitar or electric bass or even piano wire sometimes, depending on the type it is, you got steel strings that are then wrapped with bronze. These are usually phosphor bronzes, right? And so here, this is a large ship propeller from World War II that was cast, right? Ship propellers are not made out of bronze anymore, right? But when they were, they were typically these phosphor, phosphor bronzes. And then the very last kind, and um, are these beryllium bronzes sometimes called beryllium copper or copper beryllium. It's copper with a small percentage of beryllium added into it. These are insanely expensive because anything with beryllium is very expensive because beryllium is super toxic, right? So it's fine in the metal. Once beryllium is in an alloy, there's no danger, but pure beryllium in powder form, right, will kill you but not until 20 years after you've been in contact with it. Um, and then it's a slow, horrible, painful death. Uh, unless you're one of the lucky few who have an acute sensitivity to beryllium, and then it can kill you in a couple minutes. <laughs> right, but um, it's, so that's why anything with beryllium in it is very expensive. Um, It's, it's much higher strength, but it's still non-magnetic and non-sparking. The only reason that I know it's still used is for cryogenic service. It has no ductile to brittle transition, and it retains ductility at like liquid helium temperatures. So if someone needs non-sparking tools that need to be used at liquid helium temperatures, Beryllium bronze is your way to go, right? Um, so tubing and tooling at, for cryogenic things is the only thing I really know of that used to. There used to be uh, like high-end race wheels, like Formula One level wheels made out of these things, but that's all been replaced, right? That's not, not, something, that's, uh, not something that's used anymore. So that's the the wrap up of the random cast iron and non ferrous stuff that we didn't get to copper of course plain copper is of course used for conductors and almost nothing else um so there's not a whole lot to to talk about there other than as a uh metal that's useful for comparison to Aluminum and nickel, because it, of this, the range of stacking faults, right? Aluminum is, is uh, um, very high stacking fault. Copper and nickel are, are lower stacking faults. So it's a useful comparison uh, for fundamental physical metallurgy studies, but there's not a whole lot out there that doesn't, that's not electrical conduction or heat conduction that you would use plain copper.
exit. And we're 10 minutes early. <laughs>